Okay, so we are recording and let's get started. So once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I'm Carrie Gatto and I own Big Picture Realty, which is a team of Keller Williams. And I'm looking for ordinary families and individuals who want to harness the power of real estate to achieve financial wellness and peace of mind. So whether you're interested in buying or selling an income property, I can answer all of your questions. And if I don't know the answer, I call on my colleagues who are experts in the fields of real estate and investing. And today I've gathered an expert panel to address important considerations of being an absentee landlord. Um, so again, we have muted everyone so there's less background noise, but we would love to hear your questions. So please use the chat box for questions or comments and uh, we'll address them at the end. Um, feel free to leave your video on or off. Um, this is your time, so um, however you need to use it, it's fine. All right, so obviously if you're here today, you already know the power of real estate investing for financial independence. However, what are some of the big questions that absentee landlords really should consider? Well, here are some of them. Um, if you're planning to move out of the area, should you hold or sell your investment property or properties? If you're an absentee landlord or planning to be one, who can you rely on to cost effectively manage your property to make it a truly passive investment? And with the COVID-19 situation, the obvious question is, is this even a good time to think about this? Also, what are the important numbers that you need to analyze in order to make the most informed decision? And what other investment opportunities might be available around real estate investing that you haven't even explored or thought about? And if you decide to do this, how can you best prepare and make it the most profitable experience possible? And can you retire when you want using real estate as part of your overall investment strategy? And so to help us answer those questions for you today, we have on our panel, Jamie Thompson, who is a property manager and rental agent in this area. And he's going to speak about how to find the right people and take the stress out of real estate for you. And then I will talk about the market, especially for sales. And Wolfgang Cease is going to talk about an investment opportunity that you might not have considered related to investment property. Emily Clare is a financial advisor with Edward Jones and will help you plan and organize your finances for any kind of investment decision. And finally, Sarah Hartline will help you analyze the legal ramifications of your real estate holdings on your estate. Okay, so, um, I would love to just do a real quick poll of the people that are here um, in the chat box. If you could tell us if you're already an absentee landlord, yes or no, um, and maybe how many properties you, you own currently, just so we get a sense of who our audience is. Um, that would be really helpful. And then um, as you're doing that, I will introduce our first speaker who is Jamie Thompson. Um, and for absentee landlords, as you know, a great property manager is worth their weight in gold. So Jamie's going to talk about how to effectively manage your properties and maximize your return, as well as how to hire a great property manager. Jamie, over to you. Good, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jamie Thompson, Thompson Realty. I've uh, been in property management for the past five years. Uh, it is our primary business. Uh, give you a quick rental market update. Uh, for those of you that are in the business, you've probably seen a significant change in what you're used to. Um, so from a listing units perspective, obviously we've seen a significant increase in available units on the market this season. Uh, average days on market uh, compared to last year is up. Average list price is down and the absorption rate, which we are seeing a significant increase with is um, down as well. So you're seeing a lot fewer units rented compared to what we have seen realistically over the past 10 or 12 years. A couple of impacts that are causing that. Uh, COVID-19, uh, we're seeing some differences in unit demand. 
amenity demand, working from home, and students as well. A lot of people are changing their perspective on where they're looking to rent. Uh, you used to see a lot of demand for near commuter access. Now we're seeing a primary focus on outdoor space or uh, deck or patio. Uh, increased demand for additional room space for people to use for offices for working from home. Uh, I've seen a lot of people moving from one bedrooms to two bedrooms or two bedrooms to three bedrooms in the market. Another big statistic that Pew came out with uh, actually this month, 52% of young adults uh, up to age 29 have moved in with family. Uh, that's compared to 47% last year. Obviously that is a significant hit from the student market, uh, both students and graduate students, as well as early professionals that have moved in with family to save money or they may have lost their jobs and moved into with family. Uh, the eviction moratoriums have also created a reduction in activity. A lot of people aren't moving. Landlords have made deals with existing tenants in order to keep their units occupied so they don't run into the vacancy situations that we're seeing. And some tenants aren't moving because they're not paying rents, which is also a hit to an owner. Uh, next slide. So taking the stress out of real estate. That is our primary focus in property management. Uh, our goal is to take the pressure off of you as the owner so that you can focus on your investment, not the day-to-day -day operations of that investment. Uh, we handle the tenant activities, communications with the tenants, collecting rents, uh, maintenance, call, maintenance requests, or just any inquiries that the tenants may have. We're responsible for contractor management. So if you have uh, plumbers, electricians, handymen, anything that has to do with repairs, as well as landscaping, seasonal activities, gutter cleanings, tree trimming, snow removal all the things that keep that property running so that the tenants are happy with their environment. Long-term improvements, uh, things like siding with the property, roof repairs, replacements of the roofs, uh, foundation work, uh, paving of the property, and any investments that you wanna put into the property to increase the value. Uh, turnover and screenings, again, these are uh, more tenant activities where you have a turnover. So you're gonna look at leasing, uh, marketing of the apartments, um, as well as managing the unit if you're going to be doing any renovations, making a decision on what to add for amenities, things like that. And we are responsible for the market knowledge, seeing what the competition is like in the area where your property sits, uh, what are the amenities that are in demand versus what is uh, was in, in previously in demand, what's changed. Uh, a lot of demand for in-unit laundry, for example, compared to shared laundry now. Next slide. Our second responsibility, oh, one back, is optimizing the return on your investment. Again, my primary focus is the stress and making sure that things are maintained and occupied. Then we start to look at the financials and how to improve the return on your investments. Uh, the, your return from the property isn't solely realized when you sell the property. It can be realized during the operations portion by optimizing your rents to market rents and to limit general expenses. Your rent historically has been based on location. We're starting to see that change in behavior. Uh, number of bedrooms and the layout of the property. We're seeing a lot of demand if there's an extra room for office space. Quality and condition, the amenities that are in your unit and on your property. And again, market demand and competition, which we're seeing is, is the biggest impact for the market today. Next is maintaining your expenses and depreciation of investments. Uh, keeping the operational and seasonal expenses to a reasonable level. Uh, investing in infrastructure and structural repairs, keeping the quality and condition of the property up. And then taking into consideration when you're doing any work on a property that is an expense, uh, minor expense, or if you're doing a long-term depreciation investment, consider the usable life of those investments. Look at them as providing a return based on the quality and the condition of the property and that you'll be getting something out of an increase to rents, things like that. Next slide. Then maintaining tenancy. So this hits on your expenses. Aside from general repairs, turnovers are gonna be your biggest expense, uh, hit, well, biggest hit to your investment from a uh, income perspective. Uh, at turnover, you're gonna to have to do updates to the unit and cleanings and painting, refinishing the floors or taking care of the rugs. Uh, you might do a full renovation, which could cost you, you know, five to $10,000, or you might decide to do a, a class update, which could be more expensive. 
Uh, vacancies are going to be your biggest hit to income, obviously, as well as additional costs for brokerage fees uh, to get the units rented. Also, you're going to have to pay the city for inspections uh, at turnover you, uh, before a new tenant moves in. So in order to reduce the potential of turnover, communication with your tenants. So keep communication channels open, stay up to be aware of anything that they have concerns with with regards to the property. Staying on top of general maintenance, uh, like you know, care, uh, snow removal. Um, what I like to look at is the touch points. Anything the tenants have to touch, keep up to date. Light switches, if there's something that isn't working, the tenants are gonna notice it. They may not report to you right away. So always keep up with a quarterly uh, inspection schedule for yourself to check, check on things may report. Uh, of course, responding to unplanned events. If something comes up that's unexpected, a water heater goes or you know anything like that that is not a planned maintenance item, keep the tenants apprised of the schedule, respond quickly, and keep them up to date on any changes to that schedule. Next slide. All right. So again, the value of property management is to recover your own time optimize the return in your investment and then to invest in that property for market and amenities to improve current and future value of that property. Um, that's my last slide. I will turn it back over to Carrie. She will cover the purchase and sales side of your investment property. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. As you can tell, Jamie is really good at what he does and definitely will take the stress out of real estate for you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sales side in terms of tracking your investment, maximizing your returns and potential exit strategies. But first I want to do a quick um, update on the market. It's been super interesting watching the market this year with everything that's going on. Um, and specifically comparing it to last year, which was more of a normal, although very hot market. Um, here are the numbers that I pulled yesterday. I've been tracking it every week. And what we're seeing right now is that we had a very active summer. So even though the spring, which is usually the busiest time, was uh, completely thrown off from COVID and the uh, quarantine period that we had, we are seeing that the um, the uh, volume is starting to catch up. So every week, I'm seeing that number right here on the right um, decrease. Um, so the gap is slowly closing on the year-to-date volume. And right now, this is just multifamilies in Middlesex County, which is mostly where I work. And right now, we've seen almost a thousand multifamilies that have gone under agreement year-to-date. And sold or actually closed year to date, we've seen 775, which is about 21% less than last year at this time. But again, that gap is closing every single week. It's getting closer um, because we've had such an active summer, even in multifamilies. And um, the average sale price for multifamilies is up about 5% from last year, which is a very healthy appreciation and um, largely due to the lack of inventory, very tight inventory uh, this year, and but a lot of buyer demand because of the very low interest rates. So right now, the average sale price is hovering at around almost 900,000. And active listings yesterday were uh, 228, which is actually a little bit higher than last year, almost 10% higher than the same date last year. Uh, so we might be starting to see more inventory come on the market. That might be a new trend emerging. Um, that would be great because the demand is definitely there. And the next category is month supply of inventory. And that's also increased 34% from last year at this time. So we've currently got about two and a third months of inventory available on the market. And this number is significant because it's a future predictor of uh, values. So the lower that number, um, the more probability that values are going to go up. And then when we start seeing that number increase, especially over six months, that means that we're going to start see values dropping in the future. So it's just supply and demand. And anything less than six months is considered a strong seller's market. 
So we're definitely still in a seller's market, although we may be starting to trend um, upwards, meaning we have more inventory. And then average days on market, right now it's 34. So on average, multifamilies are selling in about a month. Um, and if it's priced correctly, it usually goes much quicker than that. So that's the current market update. And um, Emily Claire, who we'll talk in a moment about financial planning, helps you track your net worth. And as a real estate consultant, I like to help my clients track their real estate investments as part of their overall financial picture. I'll help you track your equity, your cash flow, and your return on investment. From there, you can accurately determine potential for increasing your income, reducing expenses, or increasing your equity. This is just a sample analysis I recently did for a client who um, owns a two family and they bought it back in 2014. And when they really looked at the returns they were realizing on that property, they decided to use some of their equity to acquire another investment property. So as you can see, the return on investment is 400 percent over six years, which is great. And because I do watch the market daily, I can help you estimate the property value more accurately and advise you on which way it's going. And I also have great pro forma templates for flipping a property or doing a BRRRR, buy, renovate, rent, refinance, repeat strategy. I also have another webinar on that, which you can find on my YouTube channel. So um, as I mentioned, the rates um, as you probably know, are super, super low. Um, I mean, with the money being so cheap these days, it could definitely be a good time to refinance if you haven't already. You could lower your monthly payment and increase your profit margin or pull cash out to buy another property. And I would say don't wait, do it now because it's only a matter of time before rates go up. I did hear just yesterday that there might be another rate hike. Um, also, sadly, almost a third of Americans had outstanding housing payments on August 1st and forbearance and loan deferral periods are coming to an end in the near future, it's very likely we're going to see a recession. So it would be wise to free up some cash and be ready to invest when foreclosures hit the market and less people are buying. And um, Jamie mentioned, you know, doing upgrades to maximize your rental income, maybe move up in caliber of tenant and um, and market value of rent. However, you don't want to over improve for the market. The property is a business, so every dollar in should give you an exponential return. So depending on whether you want to rent or sell, Jamie and I can help you evaluate the upgrades you can do to attract the best tenants, maximize the income for your rental market, or to refinance or sell. Um, you might choose to do some work yourself if you are handy or you can hire Jamie to do, to coordinate the work for you. Um, so now let's just talk a little bit more about the exit strategies that are available to you because it's always good to have the end in mind when you're doing anything regarding your properties. Um, a lot of clients ask me about condo conversions and I know a lot of times those big ticket condo Prices can look pretty sexy, but when you factor in the cost of renovations to obtain the high-end quality finishes that condo buyers are looking for, the profit margins can be slim relative to the risk of doing it. And a lot of times my clients don't understand the cost of the renovations. It also takes on average a year or sometimes a lot longer depending on the city or town's regulations. Um, and also with that right now, the market's pretty precarious. There's a lot of uncertainty, so it might not be the best timing. Here are some of the considerations that I would definitely suggest you, you think about before doing a condo conversion. Um, the cost of labor and materials has increased a lot in recent years because of a lot of new development. And so right now, 200 to $250 per square foot is pretty standard for a high-end condo conversion. So if you think about a like a thousand square foot unit, you could be easily putting in 200K unit. Um, and then it will take on average a year or sometimes a lot longer depending on the city or town's regulations. For example, last year Somerville passed a regulation that added various steps to the condo conversion process resulting in delaying the condo sales for up to seven years. 
And so clearly that made Somerville far less attractive to condo developers. And you know, the market's always hard to predict, but currently we're noticing that the condo market is cooling in favor of suburban single families. However, if you still want to do a condo conversion and it makes sense, um, please consult with an agent um, who really knows the market and what buyers are looking for to advise you along the way. I, I also work condos, so I have a, a finger on the pulse of that market. Um, and for example, you know, you don't want to renovate the kitchen and the bedrooms and then like leave the bathroom vintage because it will just stick out like a sore thumb. And in a two or three bedroom condo, you'll need to have a tub because it's likely that a couple with a baby or planning to have a baby will buy that type of property and they need a place to bathe the baby. Um, and buyers in our market still want a dining area, not just a breakfast bar, unless it's a studio, for example. And if you finish the lower level or the attic, make sure the ceiling height is up to code to be legally used as living space. Even if you find a short buyer, it still has to get by the appraiser. So um, I've seen it all and I can definitely help um, you determine what choices to make that will attract the best buyers. Another way to maximize proceeds from a sale of a multifamily is by doing a 1031 like-kind exchange. When you sell an investment property, the proceeds of the sale are subject to capital gains tax, the rate of which will be similar to any other income tax. The good news, of course, is that if you're paying a hefty tax bill, it means you made a hefty profit. The only way to avoid paying taxes altogether is not to make any money, <laughs> but you can defer taxes on your gains indefinitely by doing a 1031 exchange. And this means that you reinvest the proceeds of the sale into another real estate investment property. Um, you can reinvest all or a portion of the proceeds. You do have to abide by the time frame that the IRS gives, which Wolfgang will talk about in a moment. Um, and I think the best way to do this is to list your existing property subject to finding a suitable replacement property so that you're not under so much of a time pressure. And if you want, um, in the chat, let us know which of these strategies might be the most interesting to you right now. Quick survey. Um, and that's it for me. If you want to talk more specifically about your goals, feel free to drop me an email or give me a call. And now I'm going to turn it over to Wolfgang. So I will stop sharing. Thanks, Carrie. Um, my name is Wolfgang Cease, and I'm a wealth advisor with Fortitude Investment Group. But I, I generally refer to myself as a brick and mortar wealth advisor, as the majority of my clients are high, high net worth real estate investors. Today, we're going to talk about the DST as an alternative 1031 exchange tool. So here are a few things we're going to talk about today. Who is Fortitude Investment Group? Some tax deferral strategies. We're going to talk more in depth about 1031 rules. And then if time permits, we're going to go through a case study of a typical DST investor. So who is Fortitude Investment Group? We were founded in 2012 and have offices in New York, New Jersey, California, Boston, and Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Our primary client base owns investment commercial real estate, and we provide them with tax-efficient investing solutions and estate planning services. We have su successfully assisted in over 1,031 exchanges in excess of over $2 billion in client exchange proceeds, and we also uh, performed the largest 1031 DST transaction in history in excess of $176 million. And that was a multifamily portfolio in Rochester, New York. So real quickly, I just wanted to talk about the commercial real estate environment. Um, you know, most values have recovered completely, if not have, have increased in value since 2008. And sellers are looking to lock in the gains and buyers are eager to secure new properties. Now, with that, as this population ages, passive ownership has become way more popular. And in the velocity of today's markets, it's a challenge to find a good replacement property 
and that's where DSTs ha have really gained in popularity. So real quickly, what is a 1031 exchange? As Kerry had mentioned, it's a strategy for deferring capital gains, taxes incurred from the sale of a business or investment real estate, and by exchanging real property for like-kind real estate, owners have uh, owners may defer tax liability and use the purchase the proceeds to purchase a replacement property. So tax deferral, why should you care? So this is an example of somebody that did really well. They bought a property for four hundred thousand dollars and they're selling it for one point one million dollars. So there's a taxable gain of seven hundred thousand dollars. So at the end of the day. If you do just sell it and you do not uh, take advantage of a 1031, you walk away with $861,400 and you pay almost $240,000 in taxes. Again, $240,000 in taxes. Whereas if you do do an exchange, you have invest, investable proceeds of the full $1.1 million to put to work. All right, so what qualifies for an exchange? rental property, commercial real estate, raw land, business real estate, and certain fractional indirect ownership interests. What does not uh, qualify for an exchange? Stocks, bonds, fix and flips, because it has to be a, a long-term capital gain. Your primary residence does not qualify, and REITs do not qualify. So real quick, Kerry had alluded to this earlier, but here's the timeline of a 1031. Day zero is when you close on the sale of your property and you have 45 days to identify your replacement property and 180 days maximum to complete this exchange. Now, I just wanna make a point here that you cannot take constructive receipt of the funds. It has to go to a qualified intermediary I've had multiple clients call me and say, hey, Wolf, I just, you know, I sold my property last week and I'm ready to do a DST. Let's get, let's get the ball rolling. And I'm like, you, you took constructive receipt of the funds and you're out. So you cannot touch the money or you cannot do a tax deferred exchange. So property replacement rules. Number one, the value of the property has to be equal or greater than the value of the property that you sold. Number two, the value of the equity, if you had $500,000 in equity in the property you sold, you have to replace that equity, that your replacement property has to have equal or greater amount of equity. And that goes into number three, which is debt. You have to replace equal or greater amount of debt as in the property that you sold. So in the first 45 days, as I mentioned, you have to identify your replacement property. There's three rules here, and you pick one of the three rules. Number one, the three property rule. You can identify a maximum of three properties and close on one or all of the properties to satisfy the exchange. That's a, that's a popular one, but number two, the 200% rule is probably the rule that I use the most. And that rule simply states that you can identify any number of properties as long as those properties don't exceed 200% of the property that you, a value of the property that you sold. So an, if you sold a property for a million dollars, you could identify as many properties as you want, as long as that, that total value does not go over $2 million. That's the most popular one. That's the one I use the most. Um, and then rule number three, it's the 95% rule. And that rule states that you can identify any number of properties for any value, but the investor must close on 95% of the value identified. I've never seen this rule in practice, but it could come up in some circumstances, but highly unlikely you would use that rule. Okay, let's talk about the Delaware Statutory Trust for a minute here. Um, it came about in 2004, it was IRS ruling 2004-86. These are assets that are institutional investment grade assets, generally, you know, class A or B plus properties that are fully stabilized, rented out, 
and not in need of uh, any work done, any major renovation done. And so these Delaware statutory trusts can be used as a 1031 exchange replacement. And they're offered to accredited investors. And we have many different varying, which I'll show later in a slide later on, varying equity and debt levels to help, help one match their equity and debt needs for, to, to do the exchange. So some characteristics of DSTs. It's passive ownership. You don't have to be a landlord anymore. You know, if somebody's sick of the, the terrible teas, tenants, trash, and toilets, they can move on. Expertise of an institutional well-known sponsor company that manages it, the day-to-day -day operations. Debt, which is often unlooked or untalked about, uh, very good characteristic of a DST, is that it's non-recourse debt. So you don't have to fill out a loan, paperwork, you don't have to do anything like that. The institution, the DST has taken out the debt. So if you are stretched financially debt wise, whatever property you sold, that debt would be off your balance sheet. Number four, diversification, smaller minimum investments, you know, as, as low as 50,000, usually they're 100,000 and you can diversify by sector, sponsor, and location. Number five, it's not a blind pool. You know all the characteristics of said asset prior to investing in the DST. And finally, when you sell a DST, when it goes full cycle, you can either go into another DST, you can call carry up and find a new property, or you can cash out and pay taxes and go on your merry way. So you're not locked into the DST structure. So this is just a hypothetical example of a DST. Won't go that far into it, but it's a 328 unit building. Um, the sponsor bought it for 80 million. There's 40 million in equity that they will raise and 40 million in debt that will be associated with that. And it's gonna pay somewhere between four and 6% in year one. And again, on the last slide, I said, it's not a blind pool. You'll know the property type, the address, the tenants in place, the financing terms, the lease terms, and the risks and disclosures prior to investing. All right, so who's a typical with DST? Investor, somebody that has owned and appreciated real estate asset. It's inherently an estate planning tool. Um, it's somebody that's looking, that's potentially look, looking towards retirement and is again, sick of the terrible T's. Somebody that's looking for passive cash flow. And somebody that, that's escaping the local real estate market. As we all know, in New England, the market's been great but maybe they wanna take some chips off the table here and invest in a multifamily DST that's in Las Vegas or a, a different state out west or a, a different uh, sector. And lastly, a lot of people come to me because it's day 42 and they have not found an exchange property and they, they are scrambling to find something so that they don't get hit with that big tax bill. All right. Here's a case study, a client profile, married couple, 71 years old, wife's in good health, husband had a health scare recently. They've got a child in the 50s and one grandchild in college. They own a $100 million portfolio. They've self-managed and developed these assets themselves, but their child has absolutely zero interest in managing property or being involved. And they just now received a, an offer on one of their assets that will cause a very large taxable event. Somebody like that, we see all the time. So here, as I said, we always have a menu of approximately 17 to 20 DSTs on our platform, varying from uh, different real estate sectors, geographic locations. Here's a sample uh, offering menu you know, a portfolio of some triple net properties, an Amazon distribution center, some, some multifamily, self-storage, very popular these days. 
Um, a corporate headquarters, probably not as popular these days. Triple net medical properties, senior living, more, more class A multifamily and some uh, student housing. So here is an example of somebody that sold a $20 million property with approximately 11 million in debt. With somebody like this, we would diversify them with different DSTs in different sectors with different debt levels to blend them out to their, they had a 54% LTV. So we blend them out to the 54% and set up a very diversified portfolio that um, should withstand the, 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 the real estate market and just be diversified. Here's my information. If you had any further questions, I wanted to thank Carrie for organizing this panel. And I'd also like to stress that having an expert team in place, like the panelists on this call, will make your life easier when you're performing any large financial or real estate transactions. It, I, I, I can't stress this enough. You need the right people in place to avoid some major headaches. And uh, thank you again for having me on the, on the call. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Emily Clare, who is with Edward Jones. So, I think you need to unmute Emily. I thought I had unmuted already, but I guess I haven't. Um, so I was just saying thank you everyone for, thank you Carrie for um, creating this event and for everyone on the panel for, it's been great working with you, preparing for this. Am I still muted? No. Okay, so you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, so, my name is Emily Clare. I'm a financial advisor at Ever Jones, and my office is in the North End in Boston. I'm working with a lot of clients in the greater Boston area. I also work with some clients who are remote from Boston. And uh, my work as a financial advisor is to look at your overall financial plan holistically and help you with your liquid investments, so your non-real estate investments, as well as protection strategies for your financial plan. Uh, so overall, what my goal is, is to help achieve what's most important to you. And today I'm just going to talk very briefly about how I work with clients so that you have an understanding of what I can do for you. So when you ask yourself what's most important to you, there's a lot of different things that may come to mind when you think about your financial goals. Uh, here are some of the most common areas I help clients. Preparing for retirement, living in retirement, paying for education, preparing for the unexpected, and planning your estate or inheritance. So I'm just gonna to touch on each of these areas. So um, if you have real estate income, that certainly helps you as you, you might be building up a real estate portfolio that you're living on and building um, as you prepare for retirement. And then once you're retiring, you may choose to continue owning real estate investments uh, and live off of that rental income, or you may choose to uh, sell some of those and potentially reinvest some of that for retirement. Um, you also want to have liquid investments alongside your real estate. Uh, you can't really eat a house. If you need cash, uh, you want to have some liquid investments that are easier to access. And liquid investments also don't require any work on your part as far, like, like a um, property does. So it's good to diversify your investments across different uh, strategies, including real estate and uh, more traditional liquid investments like stocks and bonds. Uh, so I would say for preparing for retirement, living in retirement, one of the most important things is to think about, you know, how to position your investments uh, strategically for taxes. Uh, so that's where we bring in a CPA to help you kind of think about that. I believe Michael's on the call. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Um, and he's the CPA that I work with. So I'll just put a shout out to him. Uh, so we've got, uh, you know, you want to start early, but as you're getting closer to retirement, if you haven't started working with a financial advisor, it's getting pretty critical to kind of protect against uh, issues that might arise in the market close to retirement. 
and also when you first start, start retirement. So I think that's a critical time uh, to have somebody that you're working with. Uh, once you retire, you want to make sure your money lasts all the way through retirement. And there's a lot of strategies that are important to take it, to do that with. So um, those are my probably the two main reasons I work with clients. Uh, I also wanted to mention paying for education, which might be your children, it might be you, your children, your grandchildren, or somebody else you care about. And just mention that this is uh, there's some tax sheltered ways to do this, and that it's also a wealth transition tool where you can perhaps transition some wealth to your grandchildren in a tax-free investment vehicle. So that's just something to, to know that um, it's not specifically related to real estate, but something that could be alongside of a real estate strategy for estate planning. Preparing for the unexpected is another big area that I help clients. So uh, we just talked a bit about how landlords now are being, are faced with um, some problems with rent sometimes are getting or vacancies. And uh, that's really, you know, being exacerbated by COVID. And COVID also impacted people's jobs and their ability to earn a paycheck. So when you think about those kinds of unexpected things, they can, or medical concern, you want to have emergency cash. And even though it's not an investment per se, it's one of the most important things I discuss with clients. So that's your first line of defense. Uh, then there's life insurance and disability insurance to protect your income when you're working in your working years. And then there's also uh, long-term care planning so that you know, you, if you need to go to a nursing home, your spouse, that this living and retirement plan is not impacted too greatly, that both of you can live comfortably or that you yourself can live comfortably or that your, you know, your beneficiaries will still receive most of your assets rather than it going all to medical care. Uh, there's also annuities which help protect against um, running out of money at the end of retirement. It can give you a guaranteed income. And you know, re rental property can serve quite a bit like an annuity too. It's a paycheck you get every month. Uh, so you know, if somebody's leaving a rental property and they might want to consider something um, that you might include in an annuity as part of that process to cover, cover that paycheck. Uh, I also want to mention Edward Jones Trust Company. So kind of moving over here to the planning your estate or inheritance. So this might be good for somebody who wants to take all of their assets, their their liquid assets and maybe some, some properties as well, and they wanna move it out of their control and they want it to be managed. So Edward Jones does have a trust company, we can manage your liquid assets plus some rental properties. Um, and we can be co-trustee, successor trustee, we can be a trustee on a special needs trust, we can handle your taxes and all of those things on the trust. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, another uh, area, so, with estate planning, I am not an estate planning attorney. We're gonna hear from Sarah Hartline next, and she will help you understand what she does. But I partner with your estate planning attorney uh, or refer you to somebody to make sure that, you know, you are transitioning your wealth as you want it to happen. And uh, a couple ways that that I could help is a universal life insurance policy could be used to equalize your distribution of assets. So let's say you have three children and one child is going to um, take over the property and the other two are not interested or capable of doing that. So you could give the entire property to the one child and then uh, give a life insurance policy payout to the other two children. And so they all receive something equal, but you don't have two, two of your children stuck with a property that they really can't use or help with uh, and they get something that's better for them. Uh, also, estate planning taxes can be quite expensive, so you could set up a life insurance policy that's meant to pay off the bill for the uh, estate taxes, and that way there's no need to sell the property at an inopportune time to cover those taxes. So that's just a couple ways that I help, but I will always, um, you know, talk holistically about everything with a client that matters to them and refer you to the right resources if you need them. Uh, I know we're getting, I don't want to go too much longer here because I know we want to leave time for Sarah. So I'll just very quickly just say, I, have, I follow this process with clients. We meet one time to talk about where you are and where you want to be. We meet a second time for me to give you recommendations on what your, what tools and 
and strategies I would recommend you follow. And then if you become a client, we partner together over the long term to help you stay on track. And we use um, vet investments that are vetted by Edward Jones Research Department, sort of like Whole Foods. You're not going to end up buying a single product with MSG at Whole Foods. Edward Jones is vetting out our products for quality. Uh, so anything that we are recommending, you know, I mean, it's still an investment, so there's still risk, but we, you know that it's been vetted for quality. Uh, and then I partner. So here, here are you at the center of this team. I am there. My ranch office administrator, her name is Laura. She's available um, and she gets to know all of my clients. So you've got two people who know you well. I have um, a very large, we say 95 acres of ex experts back over in St. Louis and Tempe, Arizona, or across the country who uh, we can turn to, I can turn to for expert advice about different areas of your plan. And we also have some ex, um, a special planning for people with more than 2 million in liquid assets. We can do some extra planning for you. And then we have, I partner with local legal and tax professionals. And if you don't, if you have somebody you're working with, I can help you by working with them. If you don't have somebody you're working with, I can give you a good referral. And one person that I would potentially be referring you to is Sarah Hartline, who'll be speaking next. Um, but before I introduce her, I just want to put my contact information. So if you have any questions, feel free to take a photo of the slide and reach out to me afterwards. Um, if you want to connect with me on Facebook or LinkedIn, I post articles that might interest you about the market and investment strategies and uh, be happy to talk with you. So thank you so much. Uh, now I'll introduce Sarah Hartline and uh, she is an estate planning attorney that I partner with. I'm happy to have her here. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pull up my screen here. And, yep. Great, thank you. So good afternoon, as, um, as both Emily and Carrie mentioned, I am an estate planning attorney with Margolis and Bloom. And I'm gonna be rounding out the program today with a discussion on estate planning and how that fits into uh, being a landlord. So if you already have estate planning documents, um, we do generally recommend as estate planners that you review your estate plan every five years or whenever you have a major life transition, um, such as a marriage or having a child. Buying and selling real estate is also a major life transition, always a good time to check in with your estate attorney. Um, but in addition, even if you aren't buying or selling real estate, uh, checking in and regularly reviewing your plan is important because there are always uh, changes in the laws, for example, changes to the capital gains and estate tax exemptions. So that's why it's important um, to, to check in at least every five years, um, even if um, not a lot is changing. So, um, one major part of estate planning and real estate is how you're titling your assets. So unfortunately, it's not uncommon even for somebody with a fairly sophisticated estate plan to fail to title real estate correctly to maximize the benefits of uh, any planning documents that they have. So for an example, someone might have a revocable trust, uh, but which they have established, but are still holding real estate in their individual name, uh, thereby missing out on some of the uh, benefits of that trust, such as avoidance of probate, um, or if they're still uh, holding real estate in joint names, um, for example, as tenants by the entirety, they could be missing out on potential estate tax savings. Um, so that's certainly um, a big part in terms of the real estate, um, not only having the plan in place, but also making sure that you're working with somebody, uh, hopefully an estate planning attorney and a financial advisor who are, are making sure that you're really closing the loop in terms of, of fitting everything um, your assets, your real estate into that plan. For somebody with income producing property like rental property, um, an LLC does typically make most sense. Um, unfortunately, insurance is not always enough to protect somebody against a potential lawsuit from a tenant. And uh, the LLC can make sense because um, 
It does protect personal assets from lawsuits and it can also offer owners privacy since the property can be listed in the company's name, which is another um, advantage. Uh, trusts are typically more common for property that you don't regularly rent out. However, uh, many property owners, including our clients, sometimes decide to actually use a combination of LLCs and trusts, um, such as having the LLC be owned by one or more trusts. Um, so there's definitely a few different ways that you can structure it. Um, I've here listed out some of the steps in terms of creating LLC or trust, um, but I think the most important thing about using an LLC or using a trust is, is not only setting it up correctly, but also administering it correctly. So uh, for the LLC, which um, as I mentioned, is a popular choice for, for those who own rental property, uh, if it's proven that you're actually administering the LLC incorrectly or um, illegally, your personal assets um, can still be fair game. So you need to be able to prove not only um, uh, you to prove your LLC is conducting business and not just simply being a place um, where you're holding your personal assets. So there are regular events um, that, that must occur, such as uh, filing proper tax returns, holding annual meetings. Um, and so again, um, circling back to a common theme today, just making sure that you have the right team um, because these um, small missteps can be very costly. So I know we're gonna sort of not go too far into detail on the on the different on the different types of plans um, and more just talk about in general um, what I hope would be the most important takeaway for you um, in terms of estate planning, which is that one size does not fit all. So um, a proper plan it looks not only at your real estate assets but also your other assets. Um, and often um, I talk to clients, there's trade-offs. So there might be a trade-off between estate taxes versus capital gains taxes, um, or um, there might be a trade-off between having protection or having control of an asset. Um, so it really depends on you and your goals and your family and um, who your intended beneficiaries are. Um, and uh, so, uh, it's common, I, I hear clients that come in that say, you know, my neighbor does this or my friend does this, so that's the plan that I want. Um, but I would really emphasize um, getting a, a good team of professionals um, and someone who can um, make sure that, the, that what works for you um, can figure out what works for you. And although COVID has um, made things a lot more diff difficult and understandably uh, most people uh, do not um, don't love the idea right now of going into a lawyer's office um, or a financial planner's office. Um, I, I think uh, Emily mentioned this as, as well that um, that so many um, so many people are remote right now, and our office, like many other estate planning offices, can, is now operating 100% virtually. Uh, we can actually, while the state of emergency is in place, actually do remote document signings as well, which is something that's new um, that was recently passed by Governor Baker um, while the state of emergency is in place. So you can actually do your whole uh, estate planning from, um, from A to Z um, from your own home, which is great. Um, we also do lots of weekend and uh, night appointments as well, because I know that that's often more convenient um, for our clients. So now is actually a great time. We've, we've had a, I've had a lot of recent meetings um, with clients where they have um, a virtual meeting with their family. You know, they can have a, a child from California call into the Zoom call, and, and it's a really great way of, of getting everybody on the same page um, and, um, and getting things in order. So um, I will close it out here with my estate planning uh, contact information, and that's my email address and my phone number. And thank you all for coming today. I'll turn it back to Carrie. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so I do want to open it up to questions um, on the chat. So we would love to hear any questions you might have. Obviously, uh, we have limited time today to each, for each of us to speak. So we really just scratch the surface of our, of our uh, fields of expertise, but um, would definitely love to know more about what's important to you specifically in your situation. Um, as Wolfgang mentioned earlier, um, you know, having a team is so important when you're talking about growing wealth and your investments, your most important assets. 
Um, um, yeah, so I think everyone on this panel is super trustworthy and experienced and knows what they're doing. So um, I also wanted to mention if you, you know, we could, we obviously collaborate. So if you wanted to have like a group call or a group Zoom, we can set that up. Um, you know, whatever is most helpful to you. And I will, as I mentioned in the chat, I will go ahead and share everyone's contact information via email with people who are signed up as well as a link to the recording. Um, so I'm keeping an eye on the chat. I'll see if I can unmute people too. And that way, if anybody is looking to uh, speak up, I don't know if I can do that, let's see. Um, I can do it individually. Um, but yeah, if anyone has questions, you can either raise your hand or put something in the chat box. Um, you're welcome. Thank you everyone so much for attending today. It was our pleasure. You know, there's a lot going on right now, but also um, it's a great time to really hunker down and think about what you want to do going forward and make plans and um, really work on building your financial foundation. So um, again, thank you all for being here and we really hope to be of service um, and find out more about your goals. <laughs> All right, well, if nobody has any questions, I'll just encourage people to get in touch with us individually. And, um, you know, again, we're, we're happy to do that. If anyone of the presenters has any closing thoughts, let me know. Oh, um, I saw a question just come in. Um, Yvonne says, I purchased rental properties jointly with my IRA. What's the best way to protect myself? Hmm, I guess that might be a question for Emily. Emily, any, any thoughts on that? Or would Sarah have any thoughts on that? I, I think Emily is muted. Um, I would have to know some more information. I think if that, if there, if that is directed in terms of um, more of estate planning, um, feel free to send me an email with a little bit more information um, because I'm not sure exactly um, what, 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 what you mean by that in terms of jointly with your IRA. Maybe yeah. Emily does under. Uh... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure either what. Okay. But the question is, is it uh, protecting yourself against liability? Is it protecting yourself if the mortgage, you know, if you can't pay the mortgage for some reason? So I think um, that it's probably worth having a one-on-one -on -one conversation to understand a little bit more specifically about your overall situation. And then once we understand that, then it would make sense what the, the next step is to protect. But, but uh, it, for specific advice like that, I always I always do a meeting to to really understand the full picture before I make a recommendation. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, I unmuted you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. I apologize. I was I was late, so I missed a lot of this great information. So I'm glad that this was recorded. But I did purchase property using a self-directed IRA. Um, I did, I partially own the property with uh, myself and the IRA. So um, I was just more so concerned from a liability standpoint and um, just in case, you know, just to protect myself. Um, Cause I think the IRA, that portion has some protections built in, but for myself, I have, you know, just like a, I took a liability policy through my insurance company, but I'm just not certain that that's enough or if I should just take myself off the title entirely if that would be better to just put myself into some sort of LLC or some sort of company if that would be preferable. Hmm. If that makes sense. I, I, so I, I don't know if, if Emily wanted to say something. Um, I, I, I would, I would, I would certainly, um, 
I wouldn't, I, I would want to, without knowing more about, you know, and more about your, your individual situation in terms of, you know, how you're using this, this, the property, what the sort of, uh, just a little bit more detail. Um, I wouldn't want to just give you advice based on, based on what you're, you've said so far. Um, but I would be happy if you want to email me, um, I'd be happy to, to jump on the phone and, and talk you through it, um, with getting a little bit more detail. Okay. Okay, so my, yeah, so my, uh, I can even just put my email in the, in the bot, in the chat right here, if you want to send me. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's more of an, um, a, law, a law question. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. so okay. Okay, got it. Much appreciated. Thank you. Of course. All right, great. Well, thank you. Thank you to my panel. You guys are amazing. And um, I think anybody is lucky to work with any or all of you. And as we mentioned before, having a great team is so essential to success in investing and in real estate. So um, really much thanks for all your time and effort in, uh, in working with me on this and look forward to working with you in the future. Um, if anyone has any further questions, please reach out to us. Um, individually or collectively, we're here to help. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.